And now I'd like to invite our society president, Fred White, to come and give a few words. Thank you. We've been blessed again this year with excellent students. Nancy, thank you very much for all your work. If you notice in today's paper, we've got our uh, bubble gum and, and uh, soda pop kids programs. And this is like our fourth or fifth half page we've got through the efforts of our summer staff to, and to, to get some publicity. It's always nice. We'll go see it's good. And, uh, Get, try and get as many people as we can through the door and get people aware of our programs. So, I'm Fred White. I'm, this is my first year as president of the Historical Society and Museum. And I'd like to welcome you to, to, the, uh, to the building. Some of you have been here before. We have uh, two floors of exhibits, about 4,500 square feet of space. We have 12 themes trying to reflect the our mandate is the, to preserve, the hit, preserve and exhibit the history of greater Fredericton area. So we have to do it in little, you know, vignettes of, of exhibits. And we change them around, which is take different components, medical being one to add to it. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Pam Lynch. And thank you for coming, our MLA for the area. Pam's a supporter of heritage. She, you can consider it almost any heritage event. She, she, she and her husband are usually there, so thanks, Ben. Uh, I just, about the building, we've been in this building 60 years, uh, and in next year, the Historical Society will be in business 80 years. So we're trying to keep things going. And my role is to build on what people in the past have done you know, in the Greater Frederick area, have done a great job of collecting. We have around, we think, around 45,000 items in our collection between the archives and here. So we've been, it's both a legacy and a burden to keep it and to look after it. But it it's, makes for a rich exhibit. That's why we have, uh, like, the medical exhibit as a core. Dr. Chalmers gave us some of the stuff and other, and other doctors. So uh, this exhibit, fills out the last, Dr. Atchison came to chair the exhibit committee more, about at least five years ago. Uh, they did a five year plan and they went through the whole building, changed all the exhibits, either changed them or upgraded them. And this exhibit fills the last vacant exhibit space, that the theme that we now have to rebuild. Uh, we have to clean out a storage room that had in it turned out to have 5,000 artifacts in the room in order to, like a lot of them, when I say 5,000 artifacts, a lot of them were prints and, and paintings, so they store flat maps, but it was, it's been two years in the making. Uh, so uh, just, and uh, uh, I'd like to thank the, thank the staff for all their work in, in helping build and helping get this done. And doc, Dr. Asherson and Dr. Mullally for all their professional expertise. And the staff supports them by doing the background technical work and getting the exhibit up. And uh, I guess that's, I'd like to uh, I'll do a little bit about Dr. Atchison. Uh, most people here probably know him. He's, so well known, but he leads, he, whether he's president or he's curating the exhibit, he's leading us. He can lead from the rear or your side as well as anyone I've ever seen. He does it supportively. Uh, he shares, shares his knowledge. Uh, he, had, he, he has the respect of everyone, we know that. And he's just a pleasure to work with. And we, we all learn from, from what he's doing. Uh, so it, it's his idea to look at the collection and say, we can do something with this. And I know someone else that can do it. I don't know what he's going to say to Steele with regard. They're saying what? And, he, and he, formed, he took his exhibit committee and they came up with the concept. 
and develop it. So he comes from a broad, broad background. If you can see the Gibson exhibit that we took apart, this was going to be on the deck until 3 o'clock. Uh, this room did hold a Marysville exhibit, which took him a year to put together. We took it apart two hours or an hour and a half. Staff did. That's a royal meeting when I say that wasn't here. Uh, and uh, but you can see the remnants, and it's been popular. It was three exhibits. He did it, and then we took two parts. The Marysville, the town, the Marysville Heritage Committee has a, a portable exhibit that's built on Bill's expertise in another area, which is PhD in Los Gibson. And uh, there's an exhibit in the Trailhouse on Gibson and Devon, so it covers all communities. And I guess that's the thing you would have to say when he does the medical exhibit. He brings all of the community, and you'll see information from the greater region. So, uh, well, so Bill, I just asked if you would come up and talk to your exhibit, and thank you very much for all your work. Thank you, Fred. Now we can all go home, I think. <laughs> I had a discussion with Ruth earlier today about how how uh, how many notes one prepares for events of this sort, and she said she prepared just brief outlines and, and worked from it. And I said I have every word written because if I try to speak from a brief outline, we'll be here until at least nine o'clock tonight. That's that's my that's my sin. First, I wanted to begin with a few words of thanks on my own part. First, uh, to Tasha, Tasha Mullally, who is a professor of um, history of medicine at UNB, who offered her expert advice throughout this project, and to, to whom I to my, has my undying gratitude because she actually wrote two of the narrative panels for me. That's, that's just wonderful. You know how much time goes into the preparation of one of these things. I want again to thank Ruth. I keep thanking Ruth about every year or every 18 months as we complete another exhibit. Uh, she's lived with this through every stage of development. And Simon, of course, her husband, who worked on it on this exhibit in the coldest January Saturday in living memory and survived. And I heard that he was back today and was lugging most of this exhibit upstairs to the third floor. To Dusty Green and to Nancy for their work the last three summers. To Wendy Green for her assistance in my background studies. Uh, to Jean Anderson who provided a good deal of information as well. Dr. Lee Stickles for telling us what we were looking at when we <laughs> examined the, <laughs> the artifacts we were dealing with in the collection, and for Vaughn Dunfield, whose, uh, whose uh, engineering expertise was most valuable in helping us determine the, the technology of medicine coming to us from the hospital. And Julian Liebenberg, bless her, who collected all of the original photographs for the uh, the polio uh, materials. I also want to take this opportunity to express our gratitude to the families of Dr. Everett Chalmers and John, Dr. John Lightley for their generosity in making these, these collections available to the museum. The instruments and technology found in these collections form an important part of the exhibit and reflect that of good medical practice in Fredericton between 1940 and 1970. They illustrate the practice of medicine in a sense and in a way that you could never describe it. So, on to my remarks. Well, it's finally done. And I guess my reaction is to say, thank God. <laughs> Three years in the making. Six years ago, as Fred pointed out, the York Sunbury Historical Society developed a five-year plan for its permanent exhibits. Now, the heart of the plan was seven 
permanent exhibits which together trace the history of central New Brunswick over the past four centuries. The model for the plan was the permanent exhibits of the Glenville Museum in Calgary and the Museum of the City of London in England. Our exhibits were to begin with the Maliseets and end with the mid-20th century community of Greater Fredericton. Each of the permanent exhibits presents a subject which reflects the principal developments occurring during that era. For example, the late 19th century was marked by the emergence of railways, secondary industry, and growing urban centers. Boss Gibson's career provided a way into that experience. Similarly, the early 20th century was dominated by military conflict, two world wars and the Boer War. And this is reflected in the Vimy exhibit, which is another of the permanent exhibits. The exhibit we're opening today explores the mid-20th century community of the Greater Fredericton region. Now, the dominant theme in the mid-20th century here was the federal intervention into the region brought about as a result of the Great Depression and the Second World War. The list of federal undertakings in this period is absolutely endless. I, I, let me just throw out several of them at you to give you a sense of how important uh, Ottawa's movement into the, into the region was. Unemployment insurance, this period. Old age pensions. <coughs> child's allowances. Federal transfers for post-secondary education. For welfare for job training, for the Trans-Canada Highway, for the creation of military bases, for the promotion of resource development, for industrial and infrastructure development, for the, for the development of a modern provincial civil service, and general unrestricted transfers to the province. And, and, and. All those good things that Ottawa is trying to cut back now. And I could go on at length, but I think you get the point. The impact was rapid and profound. The population of what we are now calling Fredericton Region, AKA York and Sunbury, doubled in this period, in this relatively short period. It became cent uh, increasingly centered around Fredericton or Amokto. It became increasingly white collar increasingly professional, and increasingly service-oriented. All the functions in the region, whether you're running a retail operation, or whether you're teaching, or whether you're running a provincial department, became, becomes more hierarchical, more highly structured, with greater numbers of employees. The distinction, for example, between Industrial St. John and White Collar Fredericton steadily widened in this period. Now a century ago, when you looked at Fredericton from the north side, the city skyline was dominated by steeples and smokestacks. Today, on the hilltop dominating the town from the north side, stands Pot. Of course, the regional hospital in selecting medicine as a subject for this exhibit, the exhibits committee recognized two facts. First was the museum's extensive medical holdings. And the second was the relative impact medicine has on the whole community. Needless to say, sickness and death, after all, are the common complaints of every human being. But keep in mind, as you examine the exhibit, that medicine, and this medical exhibit is every man, or if you prefer, every woman. What happened in medicine after 1945 happened in most of the expanding institutions of the region. In other words, we could have taken anything, higher education, we could have taken retailing, and done exactly the same thing with it. 